And while you're turning there, just a couple of quick announcements. This last Thursday evening, we had our first uh, midweek study, and it was great. Uh, we're going through the Truth Project, and went through the first session uh, this last week. And even though you missed the first one, and it doesn't matter which ones, if you can jump in along the way, it's. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't matter, they all stand alone, they do fit together, but it was a great time of, of fellowship and going through that together. There's flyers with more information about that in the back. And guys, next Saturday, the men's conference at Calvary Houston, um, it's already here. So uh, if you haven't signed up already, please do, and uh, talk to me afterwards if you want to carpool together. We have a couple of us already doing that, so uh, we can head down together. Um, supposed to be done by about like 1 o'clock, we get together, we have breakfast, uh, and then go right through it, and then about 1 o'clock we're done, and be back home. So uh, wives, we'll get to our honey-do list when we get home. So, uh, so if you get, a, get, a, get the guys there, it'll be a great time. So again, see me um, afterwards uh, if you'd like to carpool. Uh, or get a hold of me during the week. All right, so we're in Acts chapter 18. Again, we've been following along with uh, with Paul and uh, the group that have been uh, going through in the second missionary journey. And we've seen that the last couple of weeks going through Thessalonica and then Berea. And then Paul separates from them. He gets run out of Berea again, like every every town. It seems like, again, ministry is happening. People are getting saved. Uh, opposition coming. Paul gets run out of town there, and he ends up in Athens, and we saw that last week, that cultural center, the, the kind of the learning hub, if you would. Uh, still a shadow of what it was in its former days, but that's kind of what Athens was known for. And we see now, as we move on to chapter 18, it says in verse 1, after these things, he left Athens. After what we looked at last week, he, went to Ath he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded that all the Jews leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks but when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads, I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. For then, or then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in, a night, in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So Paul, again, leaves Athens, moves on down to this area of Corinth. And Corinth, we said Athens was kind of known for its culture and its learning. Well, Corinth had a very different reputation. Corinth was this center of, of trade and, and commerce, but also, it was known for its immorality, its drunkenness, its partying. As a matter of fact, Aphrodite had a, had a palace there, a temple to her, and she was the goddess of love and all sorts of immoral acts going on in the worship of Aphrodite. So, Paul arrives there, and it, says, it tells us that he's traveling alone. Now again, he's been traveling with a group. He travels to Athens alone, and while he's waiting for Silas and Timothy, he leaves Athens and goes on to Corinth. But we see early on, he meets up with Aquila and Priscilla, Jews, it tells us, believers no doubt, and they are, have been displaced and landed in Corinth because a, uh, an edict had been given that all Jews had to leave Rome. So they were in Rome and, had to, and got pushed out from there. Tent makers by trade, we know that that was what Paul did as well. So he kind of connects with them on several levels, and he moves in with them, starts working with the trade with them, and he starts going right to work in the ministry. We see also then that while this is going on, and we don't have a time frame for it, but no doubt several weeks go by while this is happening, but then 
Timothy and Silas arrive, and can you imagine how great that must have been for Paul after not seeing them for a while and the encouragement that must have come with that? We know that they brought financial support from the other churches that were there. They brought that because then he was able to leave the, the tent making and devote himself, it says in verse, verse 5, completely to the ministry. But far beyond that, the companionship that that must have brought to him and the, the comfort to have his to have his his ministry partners back alongside of him and no doubt the good word that they were bringing of what was going on in the other churches that as they were kind of going through and bringing that and how that must have just lifted Paul's spirits it tells us that he was going to the synagogue and we know that was just kind of his way of doing things every week go to the synagogue and it tells us that he was testifying there that Jesus is the Christ that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah and we meet, we see as we go, we will keep on reading down a little bit. Again, that is met with resistance. That is met with uh, just flat out, it tells us even blasphemy. You know, it's interesting. It's, if he was just proclaiming Jesus, just talking about Jesus, just kind of generally, probably wouldn't have been much of a big deal. But when they start saying that Jesus is the Messiah, he's the one we've been waiting for. He is God's, the one God's anointed that has already come. And no doubt is part of the message, as it always has been with Paul and Peter before. You, this is the one that you crucified and continue on with that. That's when it becomes a problem. It's the same today, right? The world doesn't have a problem if you talk about Jesus as a good guy, as a teacher, there was a whole lot of people that even even embrace, you know, the sermon on the sermon on the mount. You know, hey, there's a whole lot of good stuff in there. But when you start saying that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no other way to get right with your Creator than through Him, that's when the problem begins. That's when all of this stuff starts coming unraveled. And we see though it's interesting the word that's used there, resistant. That could be, you know, it sounds like with us, you know, maybe kind of like, no, no, maybe not, kind of thing, resistant. No, it literally means to oppose, to battle against, to dig your heels into and push back against, even to the point of, it says, blasphemy. Now, who were they in battle against? Paul? No, they weren't in battle against Paul. Paul was the messenger, right? But what they were, who they were really battling, and that's where we get to this point of the blasphemy, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit bringing conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit bringing conviction of the fact that what Paul was saying was true to their spirit, to in, internally within them. And that is what they were resisting. And that is why Luke uses the term blasphemy. The highest possible charge against anyone. We think as, as we're ranking sin, right, if, you know, as us as human beings, we're, you know, we might start with that down here more towards the bottom being lying, and then above that maybe stealing, and then we kind of move our way up, and then murder maybe up at the top of that list, you know, that whole thing. You know what's at the top of God's list with, with all sin is blasphemy. All the other sin down, down here is, is equal to him. We stand equally guilty before a holy and righteous God, but the sin, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us the sin that is unforgivable, all of those sins are forgiven. But the sin that's unforgivable is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Taking the, the truth that, that, we, that we, salvation is available in Jesus Christ, the blood that he shed for us, poured out for the forgiveness of sins, and we reject that. We basically put that underfoot. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32, Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven you, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, even in this age or in the age to come. The reason being is because the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to remove every sin. If we simply receive the free gift of salvation that was purchased for us by the blood of Jesus, all of our sin is washed away, past, present, and future. We reject that. If we push that away, if we reject the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the proclamation of God's truth, and we resist that, there is no other way. And it tells us that Paul is, is reaches the end of, of how he is dealing with this with them. It says that they, they, were, they were pushing back against him, they resisted, they blasphemed. And then it tells us his response. As we see in verse 6, it says, When they did that, 
He shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on I go to the Gentiles. That, that shaking out of the garments and stating that blood on your own heads is basically the same thing. The shaking out of the garments was a, a very demonstrative way of, of making the point and then stating it out loud, your blood being on your own heads. What was he referring to with that? Well, we know exactly what he was referring to. If you'll turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. And it tells us, and I'll start reading in verse 1. It says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon a land, and the people of the land take one man from among them, and make them their watchmen, and he sees the sword coming upon the land, and he blows the trumpet and warns the people. Then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, the sword comes and takes him away, and his blood is on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he did not take the warning. His blood will be on himself. But had he taken the warning, he would have been delivered. But, verse 6, if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes the person from them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you to be a watchman for the house of Israel, and so you will hear a message from my mouth and give it as from me. So, again, what he is saying there is a watchman. You, if, if, you, if you're warned that trouble is coming, if you're warned that it is coming against you and you don't do anything about it, that's on you. But if somebody knows that it's coming and they fail to tell you, you're still taken away. And he doesn't re take away their responsibility. He says, in your iniquity. So you deserved it. <laughs> but the, the fact that no one warned you that it was coming, I will require that from them. So that's what Paul is saying. I've told you. I have expressed to you your sin, and the fact that you are separated from your God. And I've given you the way that you can make it right, but you have resisted it. Therefore, the blood is not on my head, it's on yours. Now, do you think Paul was saying that in a, you know, I'm done with you kind of, kind of response? You know, kind of like, well, you had your chance, I'm going on to somebody else. No, I know, and you know, if, if you read Romans chapter 9, that's not Paul's heart. Paul's heart is broken as he is saying that. He, he loves his people, the Jewish people. He tells us in Romans chapter 9, he says that I wish that I could be accursed. I wish that I could take on the punishment for them so that they could be saved. That's a, that's a man's heart who loves the people that are rejecting him, loves the very ones that are persecuting him, and he's grieving over that. But he realizes that there's nothing more that he can do. And I know that that we probably all have those that we're in similar situations with, whether it be friends or family, that, that have just continually rejected the message and how it breaks our hearts. But we have to understand, as Paul did, all we can do is bring the truth. All we can do is speak the truth in love, the whole truth, and, and lay it all out, and then we have to leave it up to them and God. And we see that as Paul does that, he recognizes and realizes that his ministry is far from over. He realizes that God has opened up other doors. As this door is closed, there is another one that is open. And the funny thing about it, in my opinion, is that door is right next door. <laughs> the, the, the door of the synagogue is closed. They are rejecting him and pushing him away. So he only has to go a few feet. And he's going into the house next door that is opened up to him. There's a, a man that lives next door there. Titus Justice, it tells us, and it says that he opens up his home and he starts preaching the word of God there right next to the synagogue. And I think that's interesting and it kind of challenges me because it tells us that in verse 8 that Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord and notice many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. They moved right next door and what, are you, what, what were they hearing? What were, what were those that were still in the synagogue here? And it was only right next door. And I'm challenged by that. And I, I remember times that I've been a part of things that, what are the neighbors here? What are your neighbors here? When they're, they're right next door. 
I remember back in Arizona when we first got started the, the church back in Arizona and we had the men's Bible study at our house. And we used to have it out in the backyard in the spring and, and fall because it's just beautiful, perfect time, perfect weather in Arizona in the spring and the fall. Kind of like here. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> anyway, the evenings were just perfect, nice light breeze. And we'd have our Bible studies out in the back. And we'd have worship and then we'd have a Bible study out there. And we had a guy that actually that told me later on that he would sit out in his backyard and listen. I was like, dude, why weren't you coming on over and joining us? He said, no, it's just great. I'd just sit out there and listen. And I was like, man, that's cool, though. The neighbors are hearing. I had a chance to go on a, a, a mission trip several years back to Myanmar, which is in the news right now with everything going on over there uh, politically. But I had a chance to go on a mission trip over there. And we went to a, a particular area where Christianity was very much... Uh, very much resisted. As a matter of fact, if it was known that you were a Christian, chances are that you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be hired. Uh, you would, you'd have to probably get your your commerce through through different means than going to the store. I mean, very ostracized. So there was a, re, there, a the meeting in secret, and not necessarily, but you didn't openly proclaim it, or did they? It was amazing. We were walking down the, this this road, the dirt road, to get to where we were supposed to be teaching that day. And we were still several blocks away, and we could hear them worshiping. We could already hear them singing. And we just stopped. We're like, can you hear that? And we didn't understand. It was a different language, but we could, you know, we understood the melody. And we, and it was like, oh man, you know, kind of like this. How great is our God? What we were singing earlier. You sing that in any language. You and I know what it's singing. You know, we just sing along with it. And oh, it was just, it was so amazing. What are the neighbors hearing? And what are they seeing? They see Paul that as even though he's been pushed out, even though he's been he's being persecuted, even though he's facing all of this adversity, he doesn't give up. He doesn't have this horrible attitude. He just goes keeps on right on going right next door. And look at the fruit. How awesome is that? Crispus, the leader of the synagogue. We don't know if he was one of the heads that was pushing him out or not, or maybe he, maybe it was because of the way he was treated that was kind of the start of the whole thing. But what he heard from Paul's lips and he saw from Paul's life, he surrenders to the Holy Spirit and he's saved and his household is saved and they're baptized. What an amazing, what an amazing testimony that that is. And we see that many Corinthians, many people from the city, the same thing was happening. And again, I remind you, this was a city that the, there was a whole lot of immorality, a whole lot of craziness going on, and people are getting saved and turning their back on that old sinful lifestyle and being saved. All because Paul is being faithful and the ministry is being going forward. This guy Titus Justice opens up his home. Can you imagine the reaction from the, the Jewish leaders from seeing all of that happening right next door and the, the, their leader goes next door and others are leaving? Well, we'll see as we continue to move on that they didn't take it lying down, so to speak. But before we do, how do you picture Paul? I mean, as a pastor, I, you know, I... I, I I, I do, I elevate people that I shouldn't. And one, Paul is one of those guys. I mean, I, I feel like under, under his robes there was a cape, you know? I mean, I look, at, I look at Paul like Superman, you know? But we see something very, very interesting here. Notice in verse 9, it says, And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Do not be afraid any longer. What does that mean? Paul was afraid. Paul was, was fearing. He had anxiety. As a matter of fact, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling when I came to you. Weakness, that physically worn out. He was, he was kind of just kind of at the end, physically, emotionally. Kind of that whole like sick, sick and tired, <laughs> maybe. 
in weakness and in fear. That Greek word is phobos, which is where we get our word phobia. He wasn't just having a little bit. No, it was he, a lot and much trembling. I mean, he uses, that's how he describes himself. The same one who writes everything you and I quote about being fearful. Like, we're not given a spirit of fear, right? Paul wrote that. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, make a request, be named known to God, and the peace of God will surpass his all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote that. <laughs> that guy, he's going through this. And he's, he's dealing with all of this. And, and Jesus comes to him in a, in a vision and says, don't be afraid. Don't fear. For I am with you. You know, Jesus said that a lot. Right? Remember when we were going through the Gospel of Matthew, that's one of the things that Jesus said often to the disciples and to those following him. Fear not. Don't fear. Don't fear. Why did he have to say it all the time? Because there's a lot to be fearful of as we look around the world, as we go around the world. And, and God knows us. God knows what we see and what we face and how we're feeling. It doesn't do any good to try to pretend that we're not. When we're feeling those things and we're seeing those things, and the Lord comes to Paul, and I believe he comes to Paul because Paul probably was at the end of himself with this. We're going to see again, as we continue on in the verses that follow, it happens again. The Jewish leaders come against him, and he gets taken in front of the council and all of this kind of stuff again and again and again. And like I said, he's got tired and worn out and probably calling out to the Lord doesn't tell us that he was praying, but I have a feeling, knowing Paul from other places, he was probably praying, and probably praying along the lines of, Lord, I don't know if I can continue going on. I am at the end of myself. And that's where he comes to him, and he says, don't be afraid. Go on speaking, and don't be silent. I am with you. Paul will write Philippians 4.19, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He also writes in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always, having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. How could he write that? Because he experienced it. He lived it. He knew it. This very thing that, that Jesus tells him, you keep going, you keep moving on, I am with you, no one will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city, God is working, and I love that. Just to go back to that 2 Corinthians 9.8, God is able to make all grace abound to you. How much grace of God do you need? A little, right? A little? A little grace from God goes a long way. And he says, you have it all. <laughs> you have everything in abundance beyond what you need. So that you will always have all sufficiency in everything. I just, I love that. I could read that over and over and over again because I need to know that every day, don't you? That God's promise is that what he has in store for us, we have everything that we need all the time to get through it. Now, this is not a name it and claim it verse. <laughs> this does not mean that, hey, I can go ahead and just kind of write out my list or whatever, pray for that in the morning and just move out and know that's going to happen because that's not what it's saying. The same one who wrote 2 Corinthians 9 or 8 also writes in Ephesians that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he established beforehand. Not the stuff that I establish. Not the things that I say are going to happen, but that God has ordained for me, that God has ordained for you every day, everything that we need will be abundantly supplied for us. God's supernatural provision for everything that we need. Just even look at, look at what we've seen already in, in these verses. First of all, the, the special people that God brings in to the situation. Paul arrives in Corinth, again, physically worn out, tired, feeling all of this weak, fearful, and all alone. And who does he run into? 
Some guy named Aquila and his wife Priscilla, who, oh, just happened to be tent makers, Jews, Christians, that were in Rome, but they just happened to be in Corinth right now. Huh, what a coincidence. <laughs> Isn't that awesome how God works in that way? How, the, the fact you go, how in the world did, did my paths cross with this person? Or how in the world did this kind of thing, because God knows it all, because God has been preparing them beforehand. When, when Priscilla and Aquila, years earlier, were wondering, huh, I wonder what I should do for a living. God said, you're going to be a tent maker. Why? Because down the road, I got another guy who's a tent maker, and you're going to get together, and you're going to work, and you're going to do ministry. And guess what? It's not about making tents. <laughs> it's about getting the gospel out to the, a lost and dying world. And I got a plan, and I'm going to work all of that together. And you're going to wonder why, when things are going so good in Rome, why all of a sudden you're going to get kicked out. And you're going to be wondering, what is this all about? Here, I got this business going, and it's going really well, and I'm serving God here. And I, all of a sudden now, God, are you angry with me? What did I do wrong to have to get kicked out of Rome? God's saying, you didn't do anything wrong. As a matter of fact, you're doing everything just right. That's why I'm taking you over here, because i got something else I need you to be doing. God working all of this together, these special people that he brings into our life, the specific provision. We saw that in verse 5. Just when again, just when he kind of reached at the end of that and everything, God then brings Paul, or I'm sorry, brings Timothy and, and Silas back in. And we talked about the fact that bringing some financial provision, but far more important that the fellowship and the friendship, how much, again, what that must have been like to just see them again. He, did, he wasn't able to text them every day, you know, or, or FaceTime them. You know, he hasn't seen them in a long time. And to get, just to reconnect with them and just to be encouraged by them, I probably don't have to even ask how much a simple touch from somebody that you haven't heard from in a while or seen in a while that, that cares about you and loves you and that you care about when, when, you, when you hear from them, how much that can lift your spirits. Christina and I had that this week. There's a, a pastor and his wife that are friends of ours back in Arizona. We hadn't talked to them in a little while and they just called us, and it was like Wednesday night. And we talked for a while, and it just was so encouraging. And then we prayed together on the phone, and it was just like we hung up, and I was like, oh, I needed that. I needed that. And it was because, I know it was because the Holy Spirit placed us on their heart. And they just reached out to us, and it was just so, so special. So I encourage you that the Lord lays somebody on your heart. Just shoot them a quick text. Give them a call. You have no idea what they're going through at that moment. And it, the Lord might be just be prompting you because they need to hear a word from you. They need to hear a word from God that's going to maybe come through you. And to pray together, oh, just such, a, such an awesome thing. Paul writes 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you also are doing. Keep going. Keep doing that. There's special people, the specific provision a spectacular promise. Look at this again. Jesus saying this to, to Paul. That, that um, notice, go on, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent because everything's going to be perfect and you're never going to have any problems. <laughs> is that the promise? No, the promise is, I am with you. I am with you. As a matter of fact, God makes no bones about it. God doesn't, God doesn't try to sugarcoat anything. He doesn't try to tell us that, hey, everything's, you know, everything's perfect, everything's rosy, not going to have any issues. As a matter of fact, he says the exact opposite. One of Christina's favorite passages is in Isaiah 43. And it says this, beginning in verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob... And he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Not if. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overthrow, overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am your God, O Holy One of Israel, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Sheba in your place, 
since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Not, again, don't, it's not, hey guys, hang with me and you're never going to go through the fire. You're never going to get flooded. You're never going to, no. As a matter of fact, those things are going to happen, but I am with you. What a promise. And then, lastly, notice here too, this, this supernatural provision that comes in with through special people, specific provision, spectacular promise. Notice this, the supernatural protection. I love this part. He says, for I have many people in this city. I have many people here. Paul, you don't know what is going on with all of these people, but I do. And the things that are going on in their hearts. And... You, some of them you would never guess, as we're going to see here in a second. Some of them God has that are, that are working for him, and they don't even know they're working for him. They don't have any idea who God is, but God is in control, and God is working the whole thing. I love that verse in Habakkuk, when, I'm paraphrasing, but God says to Habakkuk, I'm doing something, and don't even bother, because you wouldn't believe it even if I told you. Because that's the way God works so Things that are so beyond our ability to put together and comprehend. And he's doing that. And so let's look at it here in verse 12. It says, But while Gallio was pro council of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. So here we go again, just like this, this same pattern, saying, This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there is, if there is a question about words and names and your own law, look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. And they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. So again, Paul gets brought by the, by the Jewish leaders in front of the local authorities again. And we've seen how this has worked out in other places, right? Where they get involved and they've had him beaten and thrown in jail and all sorts of other stuff. And so Paul has to be thinking in his mind, right? Here we go again. And I wonder if it popped into his head and saying, hey, Lord, didn't you just promise me the other night that this wasn't going to happen, that we weren't going to be going through this again? But notice, as he's about to open his mouth to start defending himself, God just kind of like almost puts his mouth, hand over his mouth, and Gallio says, I don't even want to hear this. This doesn't have anything to do with me. Deal with it yourself. That's such a great reminder to me. So often, I want to be so quick to defend myself. So quick to stand up and say, wait a second, I gotta set the record straight. This is wrong, this isn't right, all of this kind of stuff. God does such a better job though. If we will simply trust him and let him be our defense, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, for you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. Paul did nothing wrong. And here he is being attacked for it, but he, <laughs> the Lord steps in and he's the defender. And as God only could do, and he does so many times, it's interesting, we read through all through, through the Old Testament. It happened over and over again that the enemies of God and his people, if we let God just take it, guess what happens? Guess what they do a lot? If things don't start going right their way, what happens? They turn on each other, right? And they start attacking each other. And it happened so many times that, that the children of Israel would just stand back and watch as, the en as their own enemies start fighting against each other and destroying each other. Jesus said, to us as, as believers, as his followers, he says, My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. His peace. His peace is so different than what the world gives. And that's so good, right? Because what is the best thing uh, that peace in the world offers? A good relationship until you do me wrong. 
right? <laughs> I mean, until something doesn't go my way, we can be at peace. And that's the problem with all of the peace deals everywhere in the world, is you, you and I can be at peace until something go, doesn't go my way. And then all of a sudden, that whole peace thing goes off. And we see that here, where they turn on each other and they start, they, they take hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and begin beating him right in front of Gallio. And Gallio's like, hey, not my problem. And this is going on right there. You know, Paul warns us, though, in Galatians chapter 5, that we have to be so careful, even as Christians, that we don't fall into that same trap. He says in verse 15, Galatians 5, But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Because that's what happens. When we turn against each other, when, we, when, we, when our own way and our own thoughts and our own happenstance, that becomes paramount and that gets stepped on at all. So easy to turn and devour each other. But he says, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Because that's our flesh that wants that. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and they are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the, under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. And he goes on and he gives a list after that. And, so, and a lot of them, he goes, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, and then he gets to this, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. He said, guys, those types of things have no place in the life of a believer or in the body of Christ, because that's the way the world deals with things. We have to be totally different. And we see that here. Things don't go their way. They turn, they start devouring each other, and they take hold of the, the leader of the synagogue because Crispus became a Christian. So they had to get the, a, new, a new leader. And now Sosthenes is the one that's the leader. And they get a hold of him, and they start beating him. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 real quick. First Corinthians chapter 1. And Paul is now writing the first letter back after he's gone away now, and he's writing a letter back to the Corinthian church. And notice what it says. Read verse 1. For Paul, uh, Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. Hmm. Sosthenes, our brother. Back to Acts chapter 18, verse 17, they took a hold of Sosthenes and beat him. He was the, the, other lead, the second then leader. It doesn't tell us anything from that verse in Acts 18, 17 to 1 Corinthians 1, 1, but something happened. And Sosthenes became a believer. And I wonder, after they got done beating him, and he was on the ground all bloody and the crowd dispersed, if Paul didn't go over and kneel down and take care of his wounds, Paul's been there. Paul's been stoned and drug out of a city and left for dead. I guarantee you, you prayed for him. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, you've heard it said, you shall love your, enemy and hate, or love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, we have a great opportunity in our time. With a lot of opposition, a lot of the world that's coming against, but as the world turns on itself, and we see it everywhere, don't we? And I, I am not a news junkie by any, any stretch of the imagination. I, don't, I just don't have time. But the few headlines I read anymore, it is crazy how it seems like everybody is turning on each other and turning on... and. People are going to get, start getting tired of this. And we have an opportunity, even with those that maybe were in opposition against us and everything, to just continually be that one that comes alongside and encourages, be praying for them. We see how it happened, how it worked out in the life of one person, and so much opportunity for that around us today. Well, we know that Paul was there for a year and a half. We don't know how much, how, where this, this scene fits in that year and a half. 
uh, but probably towards the latter part of it. But verse 18 says, Paul, having remained many days longer, so maybe a few months longer, took leave of the brethren, and he put out for sea, uh, put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. So they, they, they leave with him. In Kentria, he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue to reason with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent, but taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, and he set sail from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea, he went up to greet the church and went down to Antioch. So we see that he leaves, uh, leaves Corinth, he goes to Ephesus. Remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago, and that he wanted to go down to Ephesus, but the Lord stopped him from going to Ephesus, and he had to go up and kind of take this big loop around. Well, he ends up in Ephesus. Aquila and Priscilla are with him, and they end up staying in Ephesus as he continues on longer. It tells us that he had his, his hair cut because he was keeping a vow. Now, that was not a legalistic thing. It was probably done somewhere along the line. We don't have any other information except at that right there, but probably somewhere along the line, like similar to fasting, maybe just consecrating himself and, and seeking the Lord in, in a different way, taking on the Nazarite vow possibly uh, just to, to go through something. But it tells us that it ends along this way and he has he gets his hair cut. Um, they, they, he leaves them there in, in Ephesus and moves on. Again, Timing wasn't right before, but God's perfect timing. Paul, again, we, we think when we, when we attach Ephesus, we think of Paul in Ephesus. Well, we're going to get to that when he comes back around again. But here he leaves Aquila and Priscilla there, the, the, the team that's going to get things started and, and, and moving there. God's way, God's timing. And Paul understands that it's all up to the Lord. He says that in verse 21. I will return to you again if God Wills. Now, that is not just a, a tagline to throw on the end of, of everything. Whenever we use that, guys, we should contemplate that. Uh, you know, I've heard people say that all the time. You know, Lord willing, you know, sh -sh -sh -sh, and it just almost becomes just kind of something that I throw on the end of something, you know. Kind of like at the end of prayers when people just say, in Jesus' name, amen. That should be a pause. <laughs> When we, when we call on Jesus' name at the end of something, we're saying that we are aligning with him in that. And that shouldn't just be, that, that shouldn't just be part of our sign-off. It should mean something. And that's the same thing with, if God wills, this is going to happen. Because what we're saying in that is, here's the plan. This is what I'd love to do. But you know what? I am fully in submission to whatever God would have. And that should give a, bring us strength and encouragement when we say those types of things, because, guys, I don't, I, I'm sure you're aligned with this if you stop and think about it with me, but that's what we want, right? God's will. <laughs> if God desires it to be, I want all of it. If he doesn't, I don't want any of it. Now, that's easier said than done, because when his will is different than ours, <laughs> sometimes all of a sudden then it's like, well, wait a second. Um, but really think about it. We really, truly do want all God's will to be done. It's really the safest place to be. I, I can't remember who said it. I've repeated it several times and probably uh, changed it up a little bit from the original quote, but bottom line is it, it, it says, you know, the man of God in the will of God, working in the spirit of God, is invincible until God says, come home. And I find great comfort in it's my desire to, to be in God's will, filled with the Spirit, because until he takes me home then, I have great comfort. Just like Paul, when, when Jesus speaking to him, don't be afraid, I'm with you, I got things going on, I got people in this city, I got all of this going on, and you are mine. Well, it tells us that he lands in Caesarea, it says he goes up to greet the church. That means Jerusalem. He went up to the Jerusalem church. No matter where you are on the planet, if you're, if you're Jewish, you're going up to Jerusalem because that's where they consider that's it. You're up there. That's, that's, that's kind of the center. And by the way, the center of the, the world is Jerusalem. It's not 
Washington, D.C., just in case you were wondering. <laughs> uh, God, God's, God's plan is all centered around Jerusalem. It's gonna, we're gonna be, that's where it's going to be again someday when Jesus put, has his throne there in his thousand-year reign. Totally different thing there. But anyway, going up to Jerusalem, and he goes and sees the church there, no doubt giving them a great report of all the things that are happening. And then he went back down to Antioch, the church that sent him out, and we'll see, we'll pick up there next time as he goes out again for his third missionary journey from there. So let's pray. Lord, thank you again for the, the opportunity to spend time in your word. And I'm amazed every, every time how it speaks so personally to what it is that we're facing. I love the fact that you show us that even Paul faced fear. Even Paul was tired. Even Paul needed encouragement, and you were there. And Lord, we know that you are always with us. Your word says that you'll never leave us, never forsake us. So Lord, I pray that anyone here right now listening to this or recorded later uh, that is tired, worn out, needing encouragement, Lord, would you just speak to our hearts today? Reinforce the fact that you are with us that you will never leave us, that you have things working that we don't have any idea about and we probably wouldn't believe it if you told us. And Lord, our desire truly is to be in your will. So have your way in us. Lord, we thank you that we understand that nothing happens by random chance. Everything that we go through is for a purpose, and you have a purpose, and your, your, your word tells us that purpose is very clear for each of us, is to mold us and shape us into the image of Jesus. So have your way. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have resisted the Holy Spirit to this point in your life, I, I beg you now to respond to his leading again, his prompting again. And repentance, turning to the Lord, being saved, is not a, it's not a long, drawn-out process. It's simply acknowledging the reality of what has already been done for you. And just pray along these lines in your heart. Just say, Lord, I thank you that your life and your death and your resurrection have paid the full debt that I owe for my sin and that I'm completely forgiven. I thank you that in your name, I'm, I'm a child of God. And so I accept by faith this reality. Come into my life. You, you take control from this point forward. Lord, we thank you for the amazing gift that you've given to us, that we truly are children of God. And Lord, use us this week. Fill us with your spirit. Give us opportunity, again, in this world that is just devouring itself. Give us opportunity to share your light. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's, uh, let's all stand, and we'll sing one last song together this morning.